Um, we're waiting for one panelist, but we're going to begin because we don't want to delay any longer. Um, I want to thank you all for coming this afternoon to the second session of our Art Design Symposium. Um, I am very, very happy to announce um, uh, the second session presenters. So the first presenter is uh, Kenneth Cobenque. He's a multi-awarded furniture designer and manufacturer from Cebu. He studied industrial design from Pratt Institute in New York and subsequently apprenticed in Italy and Germany, integrating locally sourced natural materials with innovative handmade production processes. Coben Quay's brand is known globally for its unique designs. If any of you were able to watch any of the APEC um, on the TV, Kenneth was one of the main designers. Um, he has been a pioneer in many fields, creating the first Filipino luxury brand, being the first Filipino to win the Design for Asia Award, the first Asian Designer of the Year Award, and recognized as Rattan's first virtuoso by Time Magazine. Please welcome Kenneth Coben -Kai. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> and uh, thank you, thank you for uh, coming out here. Um, I'd like to thank Philippine Women's University and Angel Shaw for inviting me here. Um, I, it gives me great honor to be in the presence of uh, um, such brilliant and talented people. And uh, I hope in, in a very, very, a very short time to be able to present to you, to show to you a bit of my world and how I transform a passion into um, you know, a global brand. Um, and uh, I also hope to be able to, to show to you how creativity and innovation can play a role in our personal and professional lives. Okay, while well, we're waiting for the projector, can you bring on that music again? <laughs> okay, so here we go. Let's try this again. Um, yeah. So. Okay, so that's me growing up in Cebu before I had hair, and that's my, my mother. My mom was a designer who was uh, unique in the sense that she invented a technique of working with rattan. And so she went across, um, she went against the traditional mold of the furniture designer and maker in those days when everybody was doing uh, American reproductions. She was experimenting and working with her own kind of furniture. And I grew up, the factory was just behind our house. So I grew up with all the craftsmen and all the, my childhood was spent playing and building my own toys, using all the materials that were left, that were lying around. Um, I wanted to take up design, but back then, my father said there was no money in design. So he forced me to take up business instead. So I took up business in UP and uh, I wanted to take up industrial design so much that I applied for the fine arts program and I didn't get accepted because I couldn't draw well enough. A few years ago they asked me to be their commencement speaker at the same college. Um, so I went instead to New York where I learned, I went to the Pratt Institute where I began to appreciate the love for form, you know? and this is the, and we were doing all these abstract exercises, and I loved it so much because then I understood that certain forms bring out emotions in all of us, 
And then I spent some time in Italy, working in, in I, went, I went to Florence, working in a leather and wood workshop. And there I began to appreciate everything that I grew up with, all the crafts, uh, making everything very, very well by hand. And sometimes you need to travel another country to appreciate your own. Um, and so back when I went back to Cebu, I wanted to make a difference in the world of design. You know, I wanted to create something very, very different. And so one time when I was trying to come up, this was about 15 years ago, I was trying to come up with a new design. I saw this tree that I grew up with, and I saw how beautiful that tree was because of the arrangement of all the, the, the branches and the stem. And as you go closer, it would begin to reveal different patterns and so on. When you go closer, the leaves, the structure of the leaves, new patterns began to emerge. And so I thought I wanted to make furniture like that. So this was my first design. It's a very, very, it's just a cubic structure like this. And so I made it round so it became more organic. Then I wrapped rattan around it. And uh, I built up this structure using now rattan and steel. And this was my first design in 1998 called uh, Yin and Yang. And uh, I knew I was onto something very different because back then everything was upholstered. This was very light, very transparent. And when you put it on a balcony like this, it doesn't block the view. It allows the light to come through. And even if it's big and heavy, it doesn't look at all um, heavy because it was transparent. So I began to create the next collections. This was the bed using still the same natural rattan and steel. And then I began to look at things which I grew up with, which we all grew up with, like baskets. And I loved the beauty of a basket because all the members in a simple basket like this contribute towards holding the whole piece together, the structure. So my second design was like a gigantic basket made out of rattan, um, abaca, and a light steel frame. And this was the balloon. And in all my designs, because you can see through it, the interior had to be as beautiful as the exterior, meaning the, there was no hiding the structure. So I made sure that in everything I do, every member is there for a purpose. It's not there for decoration. If I took one piece out, okay, the chair would be would wobble, would be different. And so here, um, you'll see a, a very, very light steel frame that's uh, then wrapped, that's, put, that's held together by rattan, which is then tied with a very thin monofilament wire, and then tied again by abaca. Okay, uh, that's the balloon which is named, uh, named after the bear in the Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book. So, uh, growing up in Cebu, I grew up with all these fishermen, and uh, I saw how beautiful the fish traps look, especially um, when the sun hits it, on sunset. So I made this table called the uh, Amaya Dining Table, and the press then likened it to a, it's like trapping you know, a hurricane within a cylinder. So this is the Maya dining table, and these are the dimple chairs. They're called dimple because of the two holes on the sides. And actually, the back legs go in there, so they're stackable. And uh, when you look at the shadows, you know, they create very, very beautiful patterns um, on the floor because of the open, transparent nature. So inspired by the human body, I made another design um, called the Pigal, and it's using a hand sculpted steel frame um, and abaca rope. And as many as 3,000 knots are used to tie the abaca rope onto the steel frame. So this is the abaca, this is the, the sofa and the easy armchair now with cushions on. And this is an example, this is the chair used outdoors. And as you can see, the, my designs are very organic. They come from nature and they look like they belong back to nature. And this is uh, a bed, then a voyage bed. 
I have to thank this bed because without this, I probably wouldn't be speaking here. This is the bed that kept me known in my own country because Brad Pitt uses it. Okay? So it takes Hollywood to get you known in your own country. Uh, it's been a lot of, it's a photogenic bed. And it's made out of uh, buri, you know, the one is thing, thing, coconut spine, and steel. I designed it like a boat because I imagine that um, when we sleep, we take a voyage into a world of dreams. And we come back the next morning. And, let's see. Okay, so then, so I had all this great furniture. Then I thought, you know, I was gonna, the, 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 the traditional business model was people bought things here from the Philippines and they went branded under different names, different labels, sold in different stores sometimes. They usually don't say it's made in the Philippines. So I said, I'm going to change all that. I'm going to make my own logo and put my name to every piece. And that didn't sit well with a lot of people. And so for about two years, we had, I had no orders. No one, no one wanted to because I insisted that they had to label everything under my name, they couldn't change. So in the first few years, people were ripping off the tags, putting their own tags on it. You know. It was totally disrespect. And so, um, but I persisted, of course. And now people you know, fight in a different city to be able to represent us. So um, subsequent designs, well, this is, this is the image that I used the beginning of our campaign. This is the croissant uh, sofa. Again, made out of uh, buri and uh, steel. So, and fishing, fishing nets. You know, I was looking at fishing nets and I tried to experiment with different structures, now using a combination of metal and cotton, cotton fabric. And this is a breakthrough for me because I was working always with natural materials. The natural materials are always brown because that's the color of dead plants. Okay. So now I could use, I could put color. So this is the dragnet um, chair. Again, made out of a very, very light, light skeletal steel frame, stainless steel legs, wrapped with cotton fabric. Then I began to experiment with um, structures patterned after cathedrals, churches, Vault, vaulted ceilings. This is the Hagia, inspired by the Hagia Sophia Cathedral. And then I said, what, you know, trying to look at fashion and at knits, trying to imagine what it would look like if I magnified a knit. And this is the cabaret sofa, made out of uh, a synthetic uh, fabric and uh, foam and steel, so it can go outdoors. And this is an example of a cabaret now used in a contract environment. Um, I'm inspired by everything. You know, even a crushed Coke can became the inspiration for the Lola, which won uh, the first award, called the Design for Asia Award, given in Hong Kong. Now this, this award is traditionally given to industrial products like Sony, Samsung, Hyundai, Nokia, and this year, they decided to award it to a lowly rattan chair. Um, the judges liked it because of its economy of uh, material. It's a very, very light structure. It's all made out of rattan. But it, it's not the traditional rattan furniture where it's like big holes. It's cut, a, a big hole rattan is then cut into several strips so you could, for better utilization. And just to show you how it's made, it starts off with a rattan pole that's bent like this. It requires only simple hand tools, and this is the frame. And now to hold the frame together, we cut the same rattan pole into very, very thick strips, um, just like this. Then it's topped off with a cushion. Yeah. And uh, in a synthetic version, it can also be used outdoors. And this is now the full collection in the living room. So, in everything we do, it's always a new technique we're trying to discover, or the development of a technique. So I wanted to perfect, you know, 
to find new ways of weaving, find new ways of doing things, and to perfect the craft, which we're really good at as a, as a people, as a country. And I want to show you, this one uh, was designed in 2001. It's called the La Luna Chair. It's still one of our best-selling chairs. It won an award in New York for a craftsmanship award. And it's made like this. It starts off with a core of rattan that's, uh, that goes around. Um, then we take it off. It would be cheaper to do this in fiberglass, but we want to keep it natural, so we stick with rattan. Then we put wooden legs on it. And then uh, a layer of recycled the foam. And then jute sack. And then the weaving starts like this. And 48 years later, just like this. Um, and the beauty about this chair is that there's two different patterns, one coarser one on the outside and a finer one on the inside. And so the craftsman has to now take these two patterns and take them on the edge and stitch them together like this. And this can only be really done here in the Philippines. Okay, this is the La Luna. And, uh, okay, this is another chair uh, called the tilt armchair. It's made out of uh, American walnut. It's walnut wood. Those of you who work with wood know how difficult it is when you have to cut it at different angles. You have to join it precisely with dowels and glue. No nails, no screws. And this is the chair. So it's like building a miniature house. And this is a testament to Filipino craftsmanship. So in all my designs, I try to make it as complicated as possible so the Chinese can't copy it. <laughs> now, a few years ago, um, I set out to design a dining table. A dining table is uh, one of the trickiest things to design because we all have our preferences for tabletops. We like it in glass, in wood, or stone. And then when you try to design a fancy base, you, know, you don't really see it when the chairs go all around it. So I decided to play with the edge. And I took an old book. Because an old book seems more beautiful as time passes. So I took wood veneers and I glued them on one on top of the other uh, to create an edge like this. And this is the parchment dining table. It's like an old book floating on stainless steel legs. And these are the chairs, they're parchment chairs. They look like bound manuscripts. So uh, these are the chairs and the covers are fully washable. And these are the cabinets. So they look like, uh, like sheets of paper that are put inside a cabinet. So as I said, inspired by everything, even blades of grass became the Yoda chair. Okay, which is, um, in the papers lately, in addition to being on the streets of Nagaitai. You know. And this, are, uh, this bowl of noodles became an inspiration for the noodle chair. And uh, this is my modern version of sheep called Harry. Uh, this is Harry in its natural habitat. <laughs> um, so even ordinary things like uh, dim sum steamers, became dim sum coffee tables made out of bamboo, leather, and uh, yeah, like this. So I'm fascinated by structure, like bicycle wheels, ferris wheels, and I designed a chair called a papillon. It's like Imelda's sleeps, um, and it's like a hammock. And this is the um, after the Sydney Opera House called Operetta, you know, for our little friends here. Um, and so I looked also at many things uh, like fashion, this is the making of the blue chair, um, inspiring techniques from haute couture. So it's like making a gown. So we take uh, microfiber, which is stitched. Um, and uh, it's reinforced uh, by 
nylon uh, filaments that are put inside it. And uh, when we made this chair, now this is my first fully upholstered chair. Everybody told me that no one would buy a chair, an upholstered chair from the Philippines. You know, because the Italians, uh, the Europeans are so good at it, why would they buy a chair like that? You know, it's not made out of rattan, there's nothing woven on it. But I sought to prove them wrong, because this is one of our best-selling um, chairs. Because uh, the, the technique and the work used to make it, it's like really making a gown. It's a lot of work. And uh, we've had to open a different section in our factory just to make these. You know, it's like uh, dressmakers and uh, sewers. Uh, very different from the traditional carpenters that we used to hire. This is the leaf chair made out of microfiber. And uh, about 10 years ago, I decided to create another brand called Hive. Now inviting other artists and other designers from all over the world to design for the brand. And this is a brand for lighting and accessories. And where furniture was too straight, you know, you can go crazy under this brand. So these are some of the designs. This is called the Halo. Um, it's made out of uh, nylon twine. It's a lamp, actually. Uh, this is made out of handmade paper. This is done by a friend of mine. Her name is Louisa Robinson. Uh, made out of a pleated uh, paper. This is the um, same lamp now in in you know, in, uh, in more numbers. And this one, this is actually uh, designed by a French guy living in the Philippines, named Francis Dravini. It's made out of pina. I wish Patisse could see this. Okay, um, it it's, it lights up, and the fabric is hand woven in his workshop. This is the Little People lamp. It's a full collection of screens and lamps made out of wire that's dipped in uh, paper pulp. Um, this is menagerie, which is done by a student of mine. You, know, uh, you sell it as a planter with wire and uh, the vines grow on it. This is just a few of the, I think, 40 collections under Hive. Just really quick. This is the Fandango. It's made out of uh, metallic fabric. It's a lamp. And so, a few years ago, about 2005, I wanted to join the, this fair. This is the most prestigious fair in the world. You know? And uh, it's very difficult for a Filipino to exhibit here. And the first time when I wanted to exhibit here, when they heard I was from the Philippines, they wanted to put me close to the bathroom on the third floor, you know, upstairs. And so I said, I wasn't going to impress the organizers by showing them more furniture because you know, it's probably coming out already from their ears. So I decided to do something different. Um, and so I decided to build a car. Okay, so this is, this is it. So this is, I decided to build a car made out of rattan, carbon fiber, steel. And so I started to experiment with shell, with an organic shell like this, and used a design of mine called the Yoda. And this was the car, which we built in three, it's an actual car. Um, we have wanted to put an electric engine in it, but there was no time, so it rolls. Okay, and you push it. And uh, when we sent it, they were so impressed that they really put us right in front of the building. And this was the first time we exhibited in Milan, in a new uh, building called the Temporary, it's called the Museum for Temporary Design. And it's now in a university in Germany um, for study. And this is called the Phoenix. And uh, actually, a lot of, it caught a lot of the real the automotive press. You know, Mercedes-Benz Stuttgart put it in their magazine. Uh, I got invited to speak to the designers at Audi. On, uh, I mean, I did, really did this for fun, just to try to get into the fair you know, in any way I could to sell more furniture. But the automotive world took it seriously. <laughs> and, uh, and it was fascinating because here I was from a country with no, nothing to do with the world of automotive design, with the industry, you know, and they were listening to me, speaking as if we're building these things for a long time. And this was the, um, and so what was fascinating for them was the use of natural materials and woven structures and to merge that with technology. So, and it's in the cover of a book that just came out uh, last, now, three months ago, called Post-Petroleum Design. It's one of the most important books 
in fact, in the world on environmental design. It came out in an ad too, in one of the biggest banks in Belgium. They use this, it's called Tomorrow is What We Make It. So from then on, I said, well, I could do this, you know? So I designed other things like electric tricycles. <laughs> um, they were building out bamboo bicycle. Now, not the traditional way of building bamboo bicycles where you just replace the steel frame with bamboo, but to really design it from the inside out. Then I built a tricycle made out of aluminum. I wanted to bring the romance back to travel. This is called the Eclipse. Yeah, it's an example of how it's used. You know, it has a um, it's an iPod dock, it's cup holders, and there's actually a cover for the top and the sides that you don't see here. And this is the Eclipse in Paris. So I do other things, you know, also the our airport, okay, which never came to the light. This is a bar design and the first year of the Aquino administration. Don't ask me what happened to this design, you know, but we did work on it. And so the, in, the parking lot there was supposed to become like a garden, so when you first arrive, when you first come, you know, you don't see Manila as a concrete jungle, but as a lush garden. And uh, we widened the whole driveway so you could pick up people, because right now you can only pick up people at a very narrow section of road, but here you can pick them up on two levels all around the, yeah, like this. And so the parking was supposed to be across uh, four level parking. This was supposed to be built in a year. You know, it's been six years now, and we still don't have a decent airport. Okay. And, uh, okay, so these are the other things I do around the world. This is the Nobu in Las Vegas. This is the Trump Club in Panama. This is in Dubai. This is a new hotel in Switzerland. This is in uh, Portugal, design hotel. This is in Greece. This is a new hotel in Costa Rica. Yeah. And these are the shows that I exhibit. This is in Paris. And a lot of these shows, um, I'm the only Filipino exhibiting there. Um, but lately, I, uh, a group of us designers are now representing the country there. Uh, this is at Maison Objet in Paris. And this is close to home in the arena. This is the APEC, the design for we use the Yoda chairs. Okay, that ends my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker who is, um, used to be one of our own, still is, the former Dean of the School of Fine Art and Design, Josephine Taraba. She's an interdisciplinary artist whose practice incorporates intersecting layers of different media, performance, sculpture, video, sound, and photography. Um, her works are in the collections of the Uchenko Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Manila, uh, a collection in Istanbul and London. Um, Josephine has shown her work um, fairly extensively um, in uh, a lot of places in Europe, as well as in um, the Philippines, in the Lopez Museum, the Cultural Center, um, and this coming March 2016, she'll be having a solo exhibition at Duamila Art Gallery, which is the oldest gallery in the Philippines in Pasay City. Uh, Josephine Taraba's work reflects on the politics of violence and dynamics of infliction and trauma, depicting spaces where empathy translates into healing. She negotiates influences from different cultures, foreign influences on Philippine culture and vice versa, taking on the investigative approach to place and time, in history and in the present, in relationship to a sense of self, using the female body as a site of, on, around, for her sculptural pieces to speak of history, 
and speak to different spaces in society. For the past six years, she has performed urban interventions in her sculptural bullet armor in different cities around the world, investigating how histories of trauma define one's identity through engagement with communities in marginal and liminal spaces. Uh, let's welcome Josephine Brown. element 
water and it was beautiful because it was all white. Um, but at the same time, my mind kept coming here um, with all the people who, who died. And so if you see at the end there, I was doing a performance. I was tracing the path of the, um, the typhoon on the snow. Same element that killed is the same element that I, I was basking in here. Um, so if you, could you go back one slide? One slide. That one, okay, so this is the virtual uh, reality that's triggered by the, the image, the still image at the back. And so it's only seen on, on the tablet. It's an app that, uh, that was um, made for this particular piece. Okay, the next slide. In 2010, I was presented the opportunity to joining, uh, of joining the Tamawan Arts Festival in Baguio. I explored the fashion ramp as a venue of a woman's exaltation as I staged my bullet sculptural dresses and I explored the woman as goddess. And so the next slide, uh, I'll just show snippets of the, of the show.
exhibited in Istanbul with other Southeast Asian uh, contemporary artists. My work, Scandals, which was first exhibited at the Lopez Museum, uh, then went to Istanbul. These are the pieces that I make out of bullets. Various slippers and a series of uh, the scandals that made made of empty bullet shells, uh, having different types of um, oh the next slide please the next uh, different types of influences. You have the Japanese, you have the Turkish hammam slippers, wearing the Turkish bath. Um, next slide. And then it went to Venice La uh, this year. I conceptualized Scandals 3, Walk With Me. Uh, it's a participative, performative piece. It deploys the idea of play for its own sake and as a means of engagement as well. It invites the audience to walk, remove their shoes and put on the slippers and experience. Uh, it offers play as an entry point. And it has uh, it entry point to the arena of um, layered ideas. Okay, so you have the power, the history, violence, and our choices. Uh, these are more uh, of the a lot of the discourses uh, of the Southeast Asian contemporary art. Okay, um, and with these bullets, um, I can't deny my earlier training. I have created some jewelry uh, with the same material. Um, oh, next, sorry. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, and next. So I also have it here. And the one on top, it's like a diamond stud with a bullet around. So, um, in my earlier years, next slide, there were some works. I worked with a jewelry company, my mother's, as I said, for 18 years. And I designed jewelry, um, and they won some international awards. Um, this is the Haitian pearls in 2003, um, and the next one in 2005. Yeah. So we were challenged to do something with water, and I looked into waterfalls for now, and then I made this. Um, the one that's previous to this was fire. And, and this is the fire, an armband. And the one behind, it's uh, corals, right? inspired by corals. So they're made in gold with um, sapphires, colored sapphires, pearls, and diamonds. Um, and so this brings me back to speak. Oh, so, so wait. Um, so this gave me the, uh, the confidence of, of uh, exhibiting abroad. So let's move on to the next. We, this is our workshop. Um, it's a humble uh, atelier. Uh, and then we started to do mold and casting of jewelry. And we um, exhibited, next slide. Uh, in Italy, we were exhibiting five times a year in between uh, the years 2008 to 2003 or 2000. 2005 to 2010, <clears throat> um, we were with a bunch of Philippine jewelers. Uh, we came to Italy, we exhibited in Vicenza Oro and Oro Gemma. So five times a year for five years. That was a, we were with um, the, uh, what was that then, the, the design center here called, um, huh? design center, no, I don't know if I Obviously. Anyway, we were we did it with the government, and then um, partly paid, but we also paid our pieces. When we went um, again, like Kenneth's experience, the first time they said the Philippines, oh, your wood is there at the back. <laughs> on the, we were actually on the on the side, um, and, and when we got there, we had a really good looking wood, and my pieces at the time were. Um, those that had a gradation of colors. And um, when I sat down in one of the symposiums and they spoke in Italy, Italian, and um, I could understand a little, but they, they started talking about the coming of the Asians and we are being copied. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> because we were one, we were the first one to bring the, the, the colored, uh, colored, um, 
a gradation into the jewelry. Then the year after the Thais came, they had all the same thing, and the Chinese. Next, so I come, I, it brings me to my latest project that I was invited to in Italy. It's called Caravan Serraglio. I'll be brief with, um, have only five minutes. Okay, and then <clears throat> uh, Caravan Serraglio first appeared in the Syrian desert and it's from the third century onwards. This refers to a place uh, that housed uh, caravans at various crossroads in the Silk Road. Uh, yeah. So this was conceptualized by a friend, um, and it was a coming together of contemporary cultural uh, ideas, exchange for exchange and collaboration. Uh, it's to in investigate the intersections of art and design and technology. So um, maybe uh, there's a video that's seven minutes. Maybe I'll just skip that. Let's just move on to the next. So we were five artists. We worked with two engineers and a, and a curator. Let's move on. Next slide. And the next slide. Uh, this is the video, but let's let's move to the next slide. Okay. Uh, so five artists worked side by side with some technical experts to carry out um, this uh, some work, you know, starting directly from work composite, no, that side before that, and uh, or, or those that have already been realized. So this is uh, Claudia, she's a sculptor and a jewelry maker as well. She has this sculpture and she wanted to convert it into some jewelry. No? So what they wanted was um, that the, uh, the artistic process be applied to the industry, the jewelry industry. Okay, so let's move to the next. So we were looking for some materials, we experimented with materials, and she was looking next. She was looking for black marble, so which at the end she ended up having this black marble. If you notice at first in the first slide. She had a big sculpture. So we used the technology that they provided us, a 3D scanner. So it scanned the, the, the sculpture, and it, including all the details of the sculpture and the material. And then she was able to put it here. Um, the next slide, we work also with an architect, next, uh, who lives in this 1,000-year-old structure um, uh, in the hills of Tuscany, next. And he was influenced by his environment and his architectural background. So, and he makes frescoes inspired by the Tuscan landscape, employing the same traditional fresco technique wait, stop, as uh, Piero della Francesca, who hails from Arezzo. Um, so he gave this sketch, and then uh, you'll see how it developed. Next, and. There next, yeah, here. He uses this uh, resulting necklace next. So you have the burnished metal there, he used bronze, and um, the black rhodium, the black parts, black electric plate. Another artist was a painter, um, and he, he has these big murals next, uh, and he wanted to transform it into jewelry, so he experimented with wood, um, with a gold uh, patina next, and he ended up with this, because he used the uh, laser cutter, so it was cutting the image from his painting into the wood, okay. and this is his final pieces, the next one, yeah, so he had a pen lens, small pen lens, um, and the next one. You can see his images on the, the next. And the next one is a Italian sculptor, Enzo Scatrali. Next. This is his studio. Uh, and he makes medallions and other works for the Vatican. Next. Just move on. <clears throat> and this is just resulting piece. Also done in black one. Next. That. Okay, so we work with engineers, uh, 
um, material engineers and machine experts. Leonardo there on the right side next. He manufactures ma machines that produce the uh, jewelry of the big companies such as Bulgari and Gucci. So they make this Italian chain, the Italian chain na alam niyo. He makes those uh, machines. Next. Uh, and we work with um, 3D uh, rendering softwares exclusively for jewelry. Next. Uh, there he's scanning the sculptural piece. Next. And we also that's also another scanner. That's what you see. And these are laser this is a laser printer. We experimented with different next um, materials, cloth, wood, jeans, rubber, next. And we ended up with a this is leather on the left side. Yeah, and the next. Um, my work uh, involved clay sculpting, so I sculpted something so that I have all the details, and it was scanned like this. And, and that's the resulting thing. So what I was challenged to do was to make a jewelry that's not too expensive, easily mass produced, and but yet creative. So I, I work with primal uh, um, images, the primal face, uh, faces, the next, um, and that's the resulting next. So I had like little bags that you could design on your own on the leather bracelet. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to last talk the next. As part of the artistic process of research, we visited monasteries, galleries, factories, uh, churches, museums, and more museums. And most of all, we had you know, we had fun working. Uh, we had fun while we were, and that's it. Thanks. <laughs>